This video introduces the t-test. First we'll discuss it conceptually and then briefly cover its implementation in R. So the goal of a t-test is to compare the mean between two samples. So remember that statistical methods test a null hypothesis, which must be a unique testable statement, only one possible outcome. So when comparing means, the null hypothesis is typically that the two samples come from populations with the same mean, or that the population mean 1, mu1 equals the population mean 2. So these are the requirements for performing a t-test, or the assumptions of the test. Your data must be measured with a continuous variable divided into predetermined categories, or, or groups. You must have univariate data, which means comparing only a single variable between the samples. The t-test compares only two samples, and it's designed to compare central tendency, the mean specifically. And finally, the t-test is a parametric test, so the data must be normally distributed. So if you follow the flow chart, you can see how you go from continuous data, one variable, two samples, central tendency with normal distribution. So conceptually, what are some of the factors that would make you think that two samples come from different populations rather than being two random draws from the same population? Well, if you had these two distributions illustrated here, intuitively you'd probably think that they came from different populations, given that they don't really overlap very much. However, in this example, you'd probably guess that the two distributions came from the same population, given that they overlap quite a lot. These two curves have the same standard deviation as in the example to the left, but the difference is that the sample means is much, much smaller. In this third example here, uh, the difference between sample means is the same as in the graph directly above it, but each distribution has a larger standard deviation, and as a result, you probably wouldn't think intuitively the two came from different populations. They overlap quite a lot, so they're probably not actually really that different. So intuitively, you can see how, one, the difference between sample means, and two, the standard deviations of each sample are important for determining whether it's likely that the two samples came from the same population or not. In addition, the sample sizes are also important because we actually really care about the standard error, the diff not the standard deviation, the standard error is a measure of the accuracy of the sample mean, how accurately it represents the population mean. So given that, it's probably not surprising that the t-test basically compares signal to noise. The signal is the difference between sample means. The greater the difference, the more likely it is that they came from different populations. And the noise is something called the pooled standard error. It's called pooled because it's a single value that incorporates the standard error of both samples. Basically, although the equations are not important for our purposes because we'll use the computer to do the math, but basically you calculate the common standard deviation simply by weighting each sample's variance by its sample size, or technically n minus 1. And so remember that standard error is just standard deviation divided by the square root of sample size, but this time you divide by you divide the common standard deviation in the left by the square root of the two sample sizes together. Okay, so this, this formula here, this signal-to-noise ratio, the difference in means divided by the pooled standard error, is called the t-statistic. But to assess its statistical significance in, in, a sort of a, in this null hypothesis framework, we need to calculate the p-value, which is the probability of observing a t-statistic at least as extreme as what we got, if the null hypothesis is true, and we need to compare that to our significance level alpha, which is traditionally 0.05. So if the resulting p-value is 0.05 or smaller, we can reject the null hypothesis and say that the two samples do have significantly different means. But to calculate the p-value, we need to know the probability of observing different particular values of t if the null hypothesis is true. So if the null hypothesis is true, the two populations truly have the same mean. So the most probable value for the t-statistic, which is the difference in means divided by the standard error, should be zero. If the two sample means are the same, then you have zero divided by something and you get zero. Uh, 
However, remember that the two samples are each randomly drawn from their population. Um, and so they may differ just by chance, just because you randomly draw something a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. So as a result, the T statistic can be a bit bigger or a bit smaller than zero, even if the null hypothesis is true. So we need to know how big or how small can it be before it is sort of too unlikely. And that's what the T distribution shows us. It shows us the probability of observing particular T statistics, which is going to vary with sample size or technically with what's called degrees of freedom. Uh, so when the sample size is small, which is the dark blue line in this example here, more extreme T statistics are slightly more likely. The curve is slightly higher at the two tails. And that's just because if you have small so samples, it's you're going to sort of maybe more easily randomly choose something a little weird. But remember that the p-value is the probability of, of observing an outcome at least as extreme as what we found if the null hypothesis is true. So the t-distribution tells us what to expect if the null hypothesis is true, and so therefore we need to define the probability of observing an outcome at least as extreme by looking at the area under the curve more extreme than our given t-statistic. So the p-value is the area under the t-distribution that's more extreme than the value you calculated. But how that is obtained depends on your alternative hypothesis. We discussed this in the previous video, um, but remember that normally your alternative hypothesis will be that there is a difference in means, but no pre-specified direction. Uh, it's that the difference in means is not zero. So if our Alternative hypothesis that the differences mean is not zero. We don't know which one is necessarily bigger than the other. Maybe sample one is bigger, maybe sample two is bigger, but we don't really know or care. Um, so in that case, we're running what's called a two-tailed test. And the p-value is calculated as the area under the curve on both tails. Right. So if you calculate your test statistic and get a t of 2, you need to find the area under the curve greater than 2, but also smaller than minus 2. Because we didn't have a pre-specified direction, and so we didn't know that sample 1 must have been bigger than 2, or vice versa. We, don't, we just know, we know there are different. But if you choose an alternative hypothesis that one sample should have a greater mean, or a smaller mean, this is called a one-tailed test. And in which case, you just look at the area under the curve in the direction that your t-statistic actually is. So remember, and this is very important, that you must decide on the alternative hypothesis prior to looking at the data. It's not based on data, it's based on some prior expectation. And so in a one-tailed test, the p-value is based on the area under the distribution beyond the t-statistic in just that one direction. So there are a couple different, a couple important assumptions that underlie the t-test. First, the two samples must be independent of one another. So this is generally not an issue in the earth sciences, but one way you might get repeated samples if, or in non-independent samples is if you have repeated measurements of the same things. So basically, you know, that's, that's the most common way this assumption is violated, if you have repeated measurements on the exact same objects. You, know, you measure the temperature of your lake um, at noon, and then you measure the temperature of your lake at noon on the next day. Those are repeated measurements of the same thing. And second, as already mentioned, the samples must be more or less at least normally distributed. The test is somewhat robust to this as long as they aren't really skewed. So as if you have a peak in the middle and it's got relatively symmetrical shape of the histogram, then it's probably fine for a t-test. Uh, the third assumption, which you'll some often hear, is that the two samples have equal variance. But this only applies to the traditional form of the t-test called the student's t-test. Uh, the default in R is something called Welch's t-test and doesn't make that assumption. Welch's t-test is generally better and you should use it anyway. So we don't really need to worry about this assumption. So as you learned, the first assumption of the t-test and many statistical tests is that the two samples are independent of each other. As I also said, that's not that common in the earth sciences to have repeated measurements or non-independent samples. But what if you do? Like, what say if you're comparing um, whether two different pH meters give comparable results on the same physical samples, for example? 
Um, in this case, you should use something called a paired t-test. And so because the pairing of measurements, of observations, is important, the paired t-test calculates the difference between each measurement. Um, so the first measurement for observation 1 minus the second measurement for observation 1, and, and so forth. So in this case, the difference would be minus 0.2 pH units for the first observation, um, plus 0.3 for the second, and so on. So the t-statistic, instead of being the difference between sample means, is now the mean difference between paired measurements. And then, just like before, it's divided by the standard error. In this case, the standard error is also calculated from those differences, and not from the raw data. And we can just divide by the square root of n. There's no need to worry about the pooled standard error, because the number of observations is the same in each of our two measurement categories. So after this point, the, the calculation of the p-value uh, from this t-statistic works in the same way that it did with the standard test. So here's how you should report the results of a t-test when you're writing a results section, for example. You should give the means of both samples. You should give the, the type of t-test. Welch's t-test normally, one versus two-tailed. Is it a paired t-test? You should give the value of the t-statistic. You should give the degrees of freedom, and you should give the p-value. So, for example, you could phrase your results something like this. My river incision rates were greater in sandstone. Give the mean. Then in granite river channels, give the mean of that. Say it's a Welch's t-test with this t-statistic and these degrees of freedom and, and this p-value. And note that if the p-value is really tiny, you can just write and say that it's less than 0 0.0001 or, or something like that. You don't have to say p equals... 2.3 times 10 to the minus 10, because really once it gets that tiny, it doesn't matter. It's just highly significant.